So good afternoon or good morning or good night, everyone. Uh, and once again, um, I apologize because for some of our colleagues, it's very early in the morning, like for Michelle, I think it's five or 6 a.m. And for the people in the other Eastern part of the world, it's probably very late, uh, 11 or even midnight. So, well, that's the good and bad things about online uh, events. So hello, everyone. First of all, thank you very much to all the participants that agreed to be part of this webinar on refugees and anthropology. This is our 11th uh, webinar from the WCA, the World Council of Anthropological Association, which, as you know, is um, an association that is uh, joined also by IAUES, uh, making together the WOW, World Anthropological Union. Uh, we started this webinars back in April 2020, when the pandemic hit the world or hit it more strongly and uh, we've been we carry them uh, every month uh, throughout 2020 and this year 2021 we've been carrying them we've been holding these events every two months so the next one will be in November um, and I anticipate it will also be a very interesting seminar on questions of hegemony and uh, what what different uh, anthropologists and colleagues from all over the world must do to find or counteract this hegemony. Anyway, today we have the theme of anthropology and refugees. And uh, I invited several colleagues that of course work on the theme, uh, all women actually. <laughs> so it's a, a female, it's a very feminine uh, uh, webinar today, which is not bad. And, um, I also want to thank uh, Ricardo Faguaga, our colleague that takes care of all this IT um, technologies things that I don't understand at all. Michel Bouchard, who is the webinar host and also his university, University of Northern uh, Columbia, I'm, I'm at Western Columbia, no, not Columbia, yes, yes, um, in Canada. And of course, also all the WCA organizing committee, my colleagues that have helped coming up with names of participants, et cetera, et cetera. So what we'll do here, as I told you in all the mails you received, this is going to be, as always, a very informal session with a very informal debate. Uh, I will give the floor to each one of you and you should talk for maximum five minutes because this is not supposed to last forever. It's supposed to last one and a half hour, two hours tops. So you will, you will all have five minutes on the first turn then we'll do a second round and you will have five minutes again. And then we'll open up to a wider debate. Uh, um, as you all know, not, not only the participants, but the people who are listening and uh, watching us, this is being recorded and broadcasted live. So you can also use the function of um, the chat to write your questions and we will try to get them all of the webinar when we open the debate to everyone. When you write on the chat, we always ask people to please uh, identify yourselves, you know, just say your name and where you come from so that we have a perspective of the wider range that this um, webinars reach. Whom do we reach in this webinar? So it's interesting to know from colleagues, uh, anthropology, anthropology colleagues from all over the world. So I will now briefly present our speakers and we will start straight away. So we have, as I said, five women, um, and I'm I'm going to present them uh, exactly following the same logic as I will uh, follow when giving them the, the floor, which is from east to west. So we will start with uh, Ceiling Sheng, who is an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology, the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And uh, she has been conducting research on asylum seekers in Hong Kong since 2012, and is completing her manuscript on the meaning of intimate relations for as asylum seekers in Hong Kong. Next, we will have Joy Owen. Joy is the head of the anthropology department at the University of Free State, uh, South Africa. And her recent work uh, with postgraduate students furthers the argument of uh, the importance of women belonging um, through a consideration of Ubuntu the conviviality and sociality as expressed between African transmigrants and citizens resident in Blumenfontein. Then we will have uh, the next speaker, Francesca Decklich. She, she's uh, from Italy, of course. Uh, she teaches um, 
Anthropology, Migration and Refugee uh, Studies at the University of Urbino. She has been research fellow of the Refugee Studies Center in Oxford and has been following up refugees from Somalia who went in their exiles through Kenya, Tanzania, and their resettlement in the USA. Then Cristina Santino, uh, she's a researcher at CRIA, the Center for Research in Anthropology in uh, Portugal. She's also a visiting professor at, uh, the, at ISCTE, the Institute for um, Social Studies. And she is the first author of, uh, well, she's the author of the first PhD thesis in Portugal on refugees. She's also the coordinator and responsible for several courses and projects on refugees, namely uh, one entitled Living in a Different Culture, Refugee Students, Access to Higher Education. And she's also a voluntary contributor to the Refugio Forum, a network of refugee associations in Portugal. Then last but not least, Bella Feldman Bianco, our colleague from Brazil. She uh, was, uh, she's now retired, but she was a professor of anthropology at the State University of Campinas, better known in Portuguese speaking countries as Unicamp. She was all, she's also a past president of the Brazilian Association of Anthropology and her recent publications focus on, focus on issues related to culture and power with emphasis on migration and displacements in comparative perspectives. She's currently the chair of displacements and a counselor at the Brazilian National Council on Immigration. So, well, uh, Francesca and Bella are also our colleagues at the WCA Organizing Committee. And I want to once again, thank everyone for uh, participating. And I will start uh, giving the floor to Ceiling, please. Uh, when, when I speak, I will unmute, uh, after speaking, I will unmute myself and I will ask, as Ricardo said before, to please keep your microphones off unless you're speaking so that it doesn't interfere. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Clara, for that introduction. And I'm very uh, honored to be amongst all these um, scholars of uh, refugees and forced displacement here today. Um, I have been conducting research um, on asylum seekers in Hong Kong uh, since 2012. And Hong Kong is a rather unique case, I think, because it is not a signatory to the Refugee Convention. However, people have been coming to Hong Kong to seek asylum, uh, first with UNHCR um, in the early 2000s, partly as a result of the tightening of borders um, in Europe and the US. And so Hong Kong was not prepared. <laughs> Uh, the government was not prepared to deal with this uh, influx and there was no mechanism in place to process these claims, even though Hong Kong is a signatory to the torture convention. So Hong Kong government and UN used to deal with the asylum cases and the torture cases separately. Um, but that created quite a number of problems. And so in 2014, a new unified screening mechanism was introduced because um, the final court of appeal ruled that Hong Kong government has the responsibility to process claims independently. So basically UNHCR stopped processing asylum claims and now all claims are referred to as non-reformant claims by Hong Kong government. Um, another interesting feature of Hong Kong is that less than 1% of all claims are recognized. So out of 27,000 claims that has been that have been processed by um, under the USM since 2014, only about 270 cases have been recognized. But that's 270 cases actually include family members. So it's not each individual case. So you may ask, why are these people here? And of course they are not, they didn't decide to come to Hong Kong. Many came to Hong Kong because Hong Kong used to have um, visa waiver with a lot of the Commonwealth countries as a consequence of part, being part of the Commonwealth, the British Commonwealth. And so quite a number of people from uh, the African continent and from South Asia could enter Hong Kong uh, visa free. 
and some of that has changed now. But nevertheless, I think I want to highlight two things. One is about the changing conditions under the changing the shifting legitimacy crisis or, or the sovereignty of Hong Kong. And so at first when they were here, basically there was indifference or simply tardiness to deal with them. But in the last eight or 10 years, there has been a tightening of control. And in fact, the new amendment to the immigration bill has further expanded the state power to detain immigration officers to carry arms and to deport claimants even when they have a judicial review in court. So there have been a lot of tightening of this control and it's interesting given the specific moment that we are witnessing these changes. A second thing that I would like to raise and this uh, is related to my project is about intimacy because uh, I've been talking to a lot of people who have been here for more than 10, 15 years. And many of them have now sought to have intimate relationships, not just as casual sex or boyfriend, girlfriends, but to get married. And I am trying to look at this search for intimacy as a form of search for mobility, both existential, but also legal mobility in order to find a way out of their limbo. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Siling. Um, we will move, go on to the next speaker. So Joy, are you there? She she was writing that she had to put her dogs out, but oh, you're back, okay. So I hope your thunderstorm is not worse and that you can join us. I hope so too. You'll, you. probably hear, you'll hear the thunder um, and the lightning. So that's a, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a backdrop, right? Um, Feeling it following you, I'm I'm feeling like I, I need to also give statistics, etc. But I, I want to take us very, very quickly um, into what I think is important about anthropology. So, yes, the, the broader kind of macro socio political environment is absolutely important because it speaks to how migrants experience um, migration. And I'm talking about migrants more broadly rather than refugees, because something that we've experienced working with um, people on the move, let's call them that, um, and particularly African peoples on the move to South Africa, is that government might have a particular understanding of the kind of um, moving person they are, the kind of migrant they might be. So yes, the um, definition of, or declaration of asylum seekers, refugees, and the undocumented migrants, illegal immigrants, economic migrants, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the, or, or the most um, impactful factor is the, the commonality of movement. And so for me, I want to start with an example. I want to give you a story. So Paul Stoller and other anthropologists often say that we are storytellers as anthropologists. And I say that we are also keepers of stories. And what do I mean by that? Often when we write, often when we have conferences, presentations, et cetera, there are stories that are not told. <laughs> they don't make it into our publications, into our articles, but it's the stories that really tell us about people's experiences and how we experience them. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a story and I'm, I'm not gonna speak for much longer than, than three minutes. So. My journey with Congolese migrants in particularly Cape Town, uh, South Africa started probably in the first few years of the 21st century. Um, and I met a set of brothers um, and ended up dancing with one <laughs> on a weekly basis as part of salsa classes. And in the process got, uh, you know, invited into the family because I got to know the brother who was a, a doorman, um, but was also the muscle. Um, and week on week, you know, we'd observe each other, we'd dance, we'd laugh, we'd, we'd engage. And eventually there was a conversation that, that sprung up between the, the brothers and myself. And when I was 
encouraged to do the PhD, I said, wait, hang on. I actually want to look at Congolese migrants because they, they're fascinating to me, right? They, they're making space in um, South Africa, which could, and many people have said it, which could be seen as xenophobic. They are picking up um, South African languages, not just English, but South Afrikaans, Sesotho, uh, Isikosa, Zulu, etc. And so I wanted to understand how are they making their way in a space which is seen as very alienating. And I had this conversation with, with one of the brothers um, in a coffee shop in observatory. And it was raining. <laughs> it was actually raining. And he then told me about his story, right? His, his journey of coming into to South Africa. And he said to me, Joy, there's this there's this river that you have to cross as you're coming from Zimbabwe and you're going into coming into South Africa. And I had been traveling, uh, literally just hopping on trucks, uh, taking a chance. And I just had this one bag with me, all my possessions and my money. And he's this huge, huge man, huge, right? So I'd think, okay, so that, that's his safety, his, his masculinity is his safety. And he talks about having to cross this river. And he says, now you know that we're trying to get into the country without being observed by the South African authorities. And as we go through this river, it's not just myself, there are all these other individuals, I don't know quite where they are from, trying to cross this river into South Africa. And I'm in the water, brown water, and it's up to my chest and I'm holding my bag, right? And I see who I assume is, is a mother with her son. And she's trying to hold him aloft, but she loses, she loses him. And I have to make a decision enough. I have to make a decision. Do I hold on to my, or do I this little boy? The decision he made was to go for the little boy. And he was able to get the young, the, the young one onto the other side of the river, the mother as well, absolutely, absolutely bowled over by what he did. And in that moment of realizing, I probably have saved some. We just lost joy. We lost joy uh, in the midst of the thunderstorm, just when the story was so interesting with the man saving the child. Joy? How's it going to end? How's it going to end? Yes. <laughs> joy, you froze. Let's see if she gets back in. She did warn us that the thunderstorm was there and she could be cut, but. Uh, Ricardo, can you write to her in the chat, see if she sees, uh, she will, she will see that she lost connection. She will eventually come back. Yes, yeah, she's not there anymore. No. It's well, let's hope she can reconnect. Yeah, let's just wait one minute so that, because she was giving us such a lively, um, you know, uh, story that I didn't want to cut her and go into somebody else. Let's just see in the next 60 seconds if she comes back because it was so lively and it's so symbolically awkward that she, exactly when she was talking about the child being saved, the thunderstorm took her. Let's see if she gets back in. It's good that at least we know the boy was saved. Yes. Otherwise, otherwise, we would all be like, <laughs> in, in suspense, in suspense, waiting for the episode. Yeah. But did, did you did you Joy, guys understand? Joy, she's Joy. yeah. I've Maxi? just spoken to Joe on the phone. She's trying to reconnect. Okay. Okay. So we'll just wait. Yeah. One minute. Did you? I, I. I. She was cut before when she was telling the story. And she was telling us that the man that she knew had to make a choice between saving the mother or the child and something else. What was the other something else, which I did not understand? Did you guys understand? A bag. 
a bag. bag. Okay. That's what I thought, but I thought I thought I had not because she was cut exactly at that minute. Okay. Okay. See, Lynn, just while we wait, can I just ask you something really quick about sure. the data you were sharing with us? Uh, where do most refugees come from, the ones that come, come to Hong Kong? Uh, right now is uh, Vietnamese, but okay. before that it was Pakistani. And a, a small fraction of them come from the African continent. The largest number of recognized refugees uh, are Yemeni, 42 of them. Okay. I was curious about that. So I'm wondering what we should do. Joy does not seem to be able to get back in again. What do you think, Muggsy? Do you think she might take very long and we should move on to the next speaker? It's oh, sort no, of disagreeable. Move on to the next one. Let's see if she can reconnect. There she is. Oh. There she is. Okay. Okay. So let's wait. Right. Are you there? <laughs> Joy? It says connecting to audio, so she might not still have the audio on. Joy, if it's easier, if you can hear us, if it's easier just to have the audio, just keep the audio, although we very much enjoy looking at your face, but sometimes it's easier not to have the image so that you don't get cut. Can you hear me, Joy? Hi, Clara, I've just joined via phone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so let's do one thing, Joy. Uh, don't use the image to see if you don't get cut off again because we were all here in suspense listening to the rest of your story. So we were at the point where the guy did save the child and the mother, right? Yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And so literally what he realizes in that moment while the mother is thanking him so profusely, he realizes that he saved a, a little one's life but in the process, he's had to let go of his own. So all his documentation, his memories, the memorabilia, the photographs, the money that he had, which would tide him over, gone, literally down the river. And what does he do? Well, he slowly but surely starts to craft a life in South Africa. And I'll, I'll leave it there, because I'm, I'm sorry that you guys have been waiting, but I'll leave it there. <laughs> And when we have our next round, go around, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more. All right, Joy, thank you so much. It sounds fair. So now we have the story in the second round, we'll have the interpretation of the story, which is of course fascinating. As unfortunately, most of the stories with refugees, I'm saying unfortunately, because they're always have, there's always, almost always a sad side to it, right? Okay, so the next speaker is Francesca, Francesca from, Hi. 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 Hi, Clara. Thank you very much for being invited to this, um, this uh, webinar, which is uh, very interesting uh, for the issues that I'm, I, I deal with also with my research. Now, as I'm I come in from Europe, I would like to say something about what is happening now in Europe because it's become a theater of policies in which border regimes become progressively stricter and the rules applied make frontier almost impenetrable. So of course, there is a composite nature of boundaries, but line of boundaries is always something more than simply delimiting a territory. Ordering and disciplining the way the borders are kept is part of it. So there is political juridical construction in which the norm for the access in the territory also determine the condition under which foreigner people can stay in the territory. And the frontier regime made a number of forms of control and regulation operating before crossing the border and continuing to operate while uh, people are uh, across the border. So it has become very difficult, almost impossible anyway to cross. The walls are being constructed in countries so this is uh, made difficult for people sometimes to move. Six, 
of the European Union, 16 walls have been constructed. Half of the member states have built some along their boundaries. And people who otherwise, say 20 years ago, would have been recognized the status of refugees on the ground, a well-founded fear of persecution in their own countries are no longer granted it, uh, let alone those who would like to migrate for economic reasons, mostly because they don't even have a right to a court to present their cases or because the court certain grants uh, no longer recognize. So the principle that guided the definition of the Geneva Convention 51 and the protocols of 1967 after the Second World War seem to have been eroded day by day up to the point of actions like forced relocation without any legal appeal of people who had already achieved to cross borders of Europe. It is not by chance that since March 2016, the refugees arrived in the island of Lesbos in Greece were forcibly relocated in Turkey following the agreement between EU and Turkey, which brought to force return to Turkey from Greece of migrants and asylum seekers. So, and people have been refueled to Turkey, even they were not Turkish. So chasing away migrants has become the priority rather than their security and the protection of their rights as human beings. There's many organizations and activists have declared the end of Europe and uh, in the sense of the principle of the state of right. So those who request asylum are put in situation of waiting, waiting and waiting without knowing their fate so that no life choices can be made while in the limbo of waiting. The discourse on, Roma, on human rights has become a discourse on who, who have human rights and who doesn't or cannot uh, achieve them. And this has been explained very well by a colleague of us, Shaharam Kojavi. So a line of boundaries is drawn, separating those who are recognized as citizens and enjoy all the rights that the European Union considers relevant for individuals and those who cannot have those rights because they cannot have the right identity documents. Those who do not have right documents cannot travel, cannot work and must wait and often must hide from authorities favoring on the other end criminalities that can help them. And they become very often main power of, uh, in the in, um, black market. Women uh, bodies have become one of the frontiers as to move many of the women have actually to undergo in incredible um, su suffering and especially rape and repeated rape. And often just one rape is not uh, enough as a ground for having um, had problems in moving or for becoming refugees. So, and uh, finally, I would say that some politicians and the demagogic and populist delirium have also at some point closed the ports, prohibiting access to the ports, to both which rescued people in the Mediterranean Sea, but this also occurs elsewhere than in Italy. But in Italy, this has arrived at the absurdity of a situation that has been epitomized by the case of Captain Carola Rakete, who brought by force the boat Sea Watch 3 in the port of Lampedusa in Italy, whose case finally, after two years, has been archived as she had the duty of leading the rescue people in a secure port. So, in, in the face of a situation of such, what is the role of anthropologists? And that is something I would like to talk in the second round, <laughs> right? Together with you guys. Thank you so much, Francesca. And wait, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so uh, once again, last but not least, our colleague from Brazil, Bella Feldman Bianco, you have the floor. Christina? Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot. <laughs> yeah, I I can't can't yeah. Sorry, sorry, Christina. Okay, Christina Sandinho from Korea, Lisbon, please. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank WCCA and Clara Saraiva, um, in particular, for inviting me to participate in this webinar, uh, whose topic I think is so important to debate, particularly nowadays, uh, when we are witnessing the rise of fascism in various parts of the world, and at the same time, attacks on human rights. Um, 
I have, uh, I will start by sharing four ideas that challenge anthropology, uh, anthropology research based on my experience uh, in Portugal. Uh, but just to, to give you a general scenario um, in Portugal, uh, well, uh, I must say that we have, uh, we uh, have government, governments willing uh, to receive refugees at least um, in their uh, narratives, political narratives. But at the same time, uh, we have refugees uh, struggling every day uh, to find their way to inclusion with dignity. So it's the very, very general situation in Portugal that I can address in the second round. Um, for now, I will start by sharing four ideas uh, that change, uh, challenge anthropology uh, here. The first idea has to do with the historical process of anthropology research on the refugees. Uh, on the one hand, the first doctoral thesis on the subject um, appeared in 2011, uh, 10 years ago, therefore. This means that I did not find um, a way uh, um, interlocutors among anthropologic, uh, anthropological colleagues with whom I would share the anguish caused by ethnographic exposure to narratives uh, of violence and torture, uh, for which uh, no one had prepared me, either scientifically or intellectually. Nonetheless, I had the opportunity to engage with all the state and societal actors in the field that manage and, respons and were responsible for refugees. Now, after 10 years, uh, the growth of anthropologic, uh, anthropological research on the subject has been large, translating into dozens of master's doctoral theses, projects, and uh, to the point that there are less opportunities to do field work. This reminds me um, uh, of an old joke where in Brazil anthropology departments, it was said that there were more anthropologists than Indians. While an amusing exaggeration, of course, the same problem occurs here. There are almost more anthropologists wanting to do their research on, on refugees than the number of refugees living here in Portugal. This leads me to a second idea. The increase in refugee research has driven universities to recognize that they must adapt to the needs of refugees. What consequences has that had in academia, particularly on anthropology professors? Uh, professors volunteer themselves to teach cultural uh, diversity and specific skills to refugees so that these refugees can adapt and succeed in Portuguese university, particularly in mine, ISCTE. Um, these co courses require a change in the entire university structure from the academic leadership to academic services and departments, student associations, and so on. As an anthropologist, we, know, we now recognize the need to work with other social sciences, such as sociologists, in order to transform and adapt the university to receive refugee students. So this is also a consequence. The third idea is right, related to positionality. From the outset, it is necessary to recognize that the existence of refugees in the world is the result of policies that are detrimental to human rights. The implication of this is that positionality must be consciously and openly political. Uh, therefore, the research we do cannot and should not be directed only to refugees, but to all governmental, non-governmental and civil society structures that in various ways are responsible for the reception and inclusion of refugees. What we do, the result of our active listening, the continuous and in-depth field work, both with refugees and responsible social structures, the participation observation, 
all these methodologies leads us to the recognition of the injustices that are being committed, marked racism, structural negligence, disguised humanitarianism, results in the need for a political positionality. This positionality induces us to choose sides, but we have a choice. Either we sit close to the power and align ourselves with political strategy of refuse, uh, refuge management, refuge management, through direct collaboration with government structures, or we stand in solidarity with the struggles of dignity uh, for dignity of the refugees themselves and become activist anthropologists. Fourth and last idea is related to the collision between refugees and collaborative anthropology. We find that many of our refugees interlocutors interact with us on the same reflexive, epistemological, and even ideological level. And some of them were already activists, academics, students, professionals, etc. I will present here, uh, when I say um, there were all these, they were uh, before they came uh, to, to Europe and to Portugal. Um, I will present here a concrete case that subst subst substantiates this idea. In Portugal, several refugees associations have created a platform which they have named Forum Refuge and which is intended, intended primarily for uh, dialogue with governmental structures, but also with other NGOs and civil society in general. One of the first measures that the refugee leaders took was to create a section composed by academics, including anthropologists, sociologists, and uh, jurists, which they called academies in at the table. Uh, if, what, if on the one hand, from a ideological point of, of view, it is comforting to know that we all take the solidarity, uh, solidarity and public position in being part of this refugee structure, therefore we are uh, taking sides, we have to be aware that we are uh, a possible manipulate, uh, manipulable uh, subjects, either by, either by our direct interlocutors or by agents of power. This, this leads us to an important reflection on our role as anthropologists, mediators, interlocutors, observers, and attentive listeners on the realities that surround us. Above all, we need to reflect on what kinds of relationships we want to build and with whom. Uh, what is, is our place in society, in science, sorry. How do we balance between uh, being collaborative and activist anthropologists and academic anthropologists who produce useful peer review papers? This is the fragile balance uh, we find ourselves in at the moment. Thank you for, for now, I think <laughs> it's enough. Thank you very much, Christina. Once again, I apologize <laughs> because I skipped you. So now indeed we come to our last speaker in the first round, Bella Feldman Bianco from Brazil. You have the floor, Bella, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for organizing this uh, webinar. Very interesting. Well, uh, I am uh, I'm uh, I'm adding to pe what people said before, or Francesca, Christina, and um, I am I will try to share uh, some images. No, I don't know. I think that I cannot. To do share screen underneath. Yeah, you are you are doing it, Bella. Yeah, it's working. Yeah, yeah it's Great. working. It's working. You have you see four four pictures. Is this? Yes. Okay. So 
I am talking, I, I, I always think historically. First, I, must, I, I want to say, refugee, migration refugee is an interdisciplinary study, uh, team. But I want to, I, I wanted to contrast the concentration camps prisoners from uh, World, Sec, World War II and the detained the people now at the borders. Uh, exactly, it's exactly the same huh? in some way. And also what it was happening in the aftermath of World War I, Second World War, and what is happening now, again. And I, the fact that I, 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 I am looking uh, in some way, very literally at the team, anthropology and refugees, or anthropology and displacement, something like this. So I want to point out that in the aftermath of the World, Second World War, there were, it, it was happening engaged anthropology, or engaged social sciences, engaged humanities. At the time that of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, at the time that the restoration of humanism after the Nazis, we, we have to remember UNESCO, the, the participation of anthropologists and other social science scientists in UNESCO's projects, either on the statement on race, the contributions and controversies about these statements of race. There was one in 1950 and the other one in 1951 that included mostly Western, uh, Western social scientists, in, such as uh, French, uh, Metro and Levi Strauss, also um, uh, British, um, uh, Alfred Huxley, Brazilian Arthur Ramos, uh, and so on. Uh, and also uh, the engagement of anthropologists and other social sciences in UNESCO's project that started in 1947 to 1951, tensions affecting international understandings. And that was directed both to race relations and this was uh, the time of the race relations project in Brazil that was then considered to be the laboratory of the paradigm of racial relations. And the, the, the results most showed the other things, but race was something, races was always an issue that, uh, and it's still an issue that we are confronting. Uh, either, if, uh, and the, also the, um, the, the, the issue of migration, then although uh, people were, anthropologists and social sciences were still thinking about assimilation, but the shift from acculturation to, to integration and the fact that migrants and including refugees were seen as very central to development. Still in terms of, uh, thinking about um, in terms of modern, modernization theory, but was like a step forward uh, 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 away from acculturation. And in fact, the problematic, uh, problematic um, uh, uh, issue of, uh, of um, integration is still back on the floor. I'm trying to go to get back to my to to the Zoom. I, I don't know how to take this off, <laughs> the picture off. Let me see. But on you just you oh. just undo the sharing screen, Bella. That's all. Just undo. Oh. Yeah, that's it. That's it. You've got it. Okay. Okay, I'm back. So now we are in a different uh, 75 years after the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we are in a situation right now that this, and I, I think that if my former colleagues talk more about the situation today, but 
Also, I think that we need to, to take into account the broader scenery that we, we are living now that is from, uh, you see, particularly the change of politics in terms of refugees and migration, uh, there, there were always, you know, those that arrived, that ha were entitled to uh, have rights and the other ones that don't, or, you know, but I think that we have to take on, into account that we are living under a very, uh, uh, in, taking into account neoliberal neo capitalism, the raising of a far, far right again, um, and uh, extreme uh, inequality, like that Saskin so talks about this dispossession, and uh, or we can talk about the accumulation of, uh, of uh, dispossession also. So increasing dispossession, brutality, and this is increasing in terms of uh, the pandemic that we are living. So if in the aftermath of the Second World War, we were as anthropologists and other so social scientists engaged with um, peace, engaged in with human dignity, we are still and in, engaged against races or issues of race, we are still engaged with the same problems, but now trying to de deconstruct borders, deconstruct criminalization. Like what is happening is not only the criminalization of refugees and migrants, but is the, the, the criminalization of poverty. And in the sense that my argument is that to, and I, I, I am um, presenting as something for, for discussion also, is that we not only we have to understand what's going on at the borders and the brutality of the borders now. I think that the picture, the, the photo in the, that was like uh, in the border of the United States and Mexico was like, he just gave me back uh, images of the colonial times, of the totality of these people on uh, riding horses and spanking with uh, 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 climate refugees. We have now more uh, in, with the increasing mobility uh, movement of people. We are we have different types now of refugees and different types of migrants. We have to take into account that before we at the aftermath of the World War, we, have, we were talking about, you know, the European uh, refugees, and now we have different sorts of refugees. So that my, my argument is that we have to look at the criminalization of poverty, we have to look at the, the different types of displacements, and I think that the issue that Christina was also bringing, that's very important, is like the, the relationship within solid academic work and social action. And we are always engaged. Even when we are not engaged, we are politically engaged. And I think that this is something that we should really discuss. And I think I, another point that I, I want to say, to, to say is that why the Declaration, Universal Declaration of Human Rights was really bringing people or diplomats from, uh, from the East to the West, the, uh, in, in the aftermath of World, World War, we have mostly Western anthropologists or Western social sciences. And now even this event brings to the fact and also the role of the WCA to, to that we are, uh, the, the dialogues are with different anthropologies around the world. Thank you very much. And, I don't know. I I hope I didn't over take more than minutes. No, no problem, Bella. You did take a bit more, you and Christina, but that's okay. Some people, you know, I say five minutes because otherwise it's too long, but it's okay. So thank you very much for the first round of contributions. We will now go back.
to the same talkers. So we'll we'll talk we'll start restart again with uh, Ceiling, please. Thank you. Um, I was going to share a story about my my research, but then I I heard from Christina and then Bella about engage anthropology. So I would like to take some time to share a video. And so as part of my research, well, no, it's not part of my research, but as I came to meet with the asylum seekers, I realized that a lot of them were very talented. Um, they, are, they are, they're performers, they're writers and so on. So I call all, we co-founded a band with a group of eight uh, asylum seekers in Hong Kong, and they have been performing in Hong Kong for about two and a half years uh, until the social disturbances in 2019, and then some of them have left. Um, I'm just gonna show 30 min 30 seconds <laughs> from a video, um, and you can definitely look it up. Uh, then, do you see the screen? Yeah, okay. And you can see Gordon dancing <gasps> here. <laughs> don't look, don't look. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. I really want to know what I've been outside. Pardon me. I really want to know what I've been outside. Pardon me. Yeah, the key to pain hides in the darkest brains. The smallest key can open up the biggest gates. A quiet person is what we might need to free us. Okay, so um, I'll just stop there uh, with the video. So you will uh, have to look it up. So this is the link. Now, um, so as I as part of my engaged um, anthropological work, I think this band was, for, was formed, and it was a very good learning experience for myself to see how providing a platform for them to express themselves was was terribly important and and sometimes life-changing um actually some of these band members moved on to form their own band and, and they formed a band that became one of the top hip-hop bands in hong kong for a while and um the uh, some other went on to pursue their music career, and it was eye-opening to see how music could be so important. Uh, I'm not a musician myself, and I know nothing about hip hop, so I was like a stranger on the side every time they perform. And so, I think when I think about engaged anthropology and what we could do. And this is always a problem. What could we do apart from writing papers? Um, uh, providing a, a platform and facilitating um, ways for them to find find their own voice, um, I think is, is a useful way and helpful way. Um, another thing that I've been doing recently is to work with a group of long-term asylum seekers who have been in Hong Kong for more than 15 years to find their way out is a um, self-organized group uh, of asylum seekers and they wanted to fight for their fight for their own rights and fight for their way out of this limbo and by you know petitioning the chief executive or petitioning foreign embassies and so on and i'm just a a clerical assistant on the side um, they run the show um, it may not have achieved anything significant in terms of practical results, but for, 
for it was important for them to feel that they could do something for themselves and not be reliant on NGOs or um, other people. So um, I think I'll, I'll stop there and, and let others pitch in. Thank you. All right, Siling, thank you so much for sharing this video. As you could all see, the link for the video is also already written on the chat. So if you want to copy thank it. You. So the next, uh, we'll go back to Joy. Joy, are you there? Or let's hope the sun Hi, is everybody. Born. Okay, all right. Just, you probably heard that loud clap of thunder as well, I hope, which means that you can hear me. <laughs> I've, I'm thinking across what, you know, um, Bernda Schieling and Christina has said. Um, and I really want to tell you another story because I think something we need to understand and, and potentially recognize is that in the South African space, we don't have uh, refugee camps, okay? So however defined economic migrant, asylum seeker, um, illegal immigrant, there's a space to filter into the South African landscape and psyche. And as a result from the word go, there's a push to to really create a, a life, not just a livelihood, but a life. So my particular work in Cape Town looked at uh, religion and how that provided certain opportunities. So paying attention to social networks, um, also looking at binational relationships, ceilings. So the, the idea of, uh, not just the idea, but the reality of relationships between South African women and Congolese men and Congolese men and European women, um, and, and literally, quite strangely, having to remain open to learning, having to uh, set aside what I thought about vulnerable populations. Because the way we speak about uh, refugees, the way we speak about even economic migrants, uh, we categorize them as particularly vulnerable because of uh, the legislation, because of the way they are treated, et cetera, et cetera. But there are also other stories that literally, if you remain open, speak to the variety that sits in the, in the human being. And that includes strategy. That includes being strategic and making particular kinds of relationships choosing to hang around certain people and not others, choosing to learn a particular language rather than another, making decisions to move. So in, in South Africa, the, the options exist to, to move between cities from rural to urban spaces, from urban to rural spaces. And literally who, would we, who we'd identify as other becomes a part of the South African psyche and landscape. So let me tell you another story, okay? And we can unpack this further in the discussion. I take you a little bit, uh, not further into time, but uh, fast forward. And I'm spending time with two of the three primary research informants, both male. They have now migrated to uh, Europe, one to Amsterdam, the other to uh, Germany and we've lost one. And, and I will refer to them as my brothers. We've lost one of our brothers. Uh, he had migrated to Switzerland. So these three I referred to as the triumvirate. They were extremely close. And for whatever reason, they decided to include me. And so I, I was able to see um, their strategy deployed in relation to accessing money so that they could continue with their studies. So these weren't working class migrants or refugees. They were well-schooled. Each had had um, some kind of training at university. And so they were keen to continue, okay? Uh, so I met them during that transit transitory phase when they were in South Africa. And, and just to correct the thinking, a lot of people in South Africa, South Africans and government included, continue to think that migrants have chosen South Africa as the settlement space, when in fact they haven't. <laughs> they actually see it as 
uh, a transiting space, but because mm -hmm. of the ways in which they are managed in inverted commas, they can't get out of South Africa. They don't get their papers in time. Um, you know, th there are questions around if they, if they assert that they are seeking political asylum, there are questions around whether, for example, particularly in the DRC, but is there still a wall? So why are you seeking political asylum? Go back to where you come from. Uh, <laughs> the implication of that is give me a little bit of money, um, you know, grease my palms and, and I'll open the process for you. And there are many who can't. They can't actually uh, provide the, the money. They can't hand over this money because what is the amount, right? So when they try to engage with um, officers, <laughs> if we can call them that, the answer is you should know. You should know how much to give me. Why should I tell you? Okay, so recently I, I spoke to a Congolese woman who was then saying, as a result, she turned back. She went, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just continue with no documentation because I don't, I don't have the money. Okay, so they're not believed. But anyway, so this is the kind of situation and I now find myself uh, walking with two of my brothers. Um, <laughs> yeah. And quite strangely, we, we're talking. Right, and, and we're talking the way Africans do. Uh, bodies, voices, laughter, stories. And I walk on the outside of them as I usually do on the pavement. And the one says to me, Joy, can you please stop that? Ne? You're still so stubborn, walk on the inside. And I say, but why would you tell me to keep walking on the inside of you? And he says, but I explained to you all those years ago, as a man, I should protect you. You're the woman. Can you just listen? <laughs> so I look at him and I look at the other one laughing and I say, but we're in a different continent. We're not on the African continent. We're supposed to be progressive. Europe is progressive, isn't it? And they laugh and they say to me, in this moment, what are we? What are we if not African? So for me in that moment, I'm reminded, I'm reminded that no matter where they go, home remains something of value. And in our later conversations, when we talk about the politics in the DRC, we talked about the politics in South Africa, it's clear that there's something that binds us. And what binds us is not my research. It's not my research with them. It's not my collaboration with them. What binds them is the human to human relationship that was created. Had they not decided as the three of them stood in Musenberg to open their lives to some level of interrogation. Because as my supervisor at the time, said I did, an, I did antagonistic field work. <laughs> I pushed people's buttons, okay? If they weren't willing to give me that space, we wouldn't have been able to create a present and we wouldn't have been able to create a future. So I've encountered their wives, I've encountered their children. For one of them, I'm a godparent to one of the children. So it, it tells us about what, what do these stories tell us? That when we work with human beings, human to human, the relationship is important. And we cannot forget the agency of the individuals we work with and collaborate with. So often we take the position of activist or advocate without necessarily asking or checking or understanding whether they want us to do so or not. I'll stop there. Um, all right, uh, Joy, thank you so much. We do have some questions on the chat already, but let, let's first uh, do the second round at, at till the end, and then we'll go to the questions and comments on the chat. So after Joy, thank you so much, Joy. Francesca, you have the floor again. Right, thank you very much. Um, yes, my my I left my my previous uh, 
stop with saying what can we do as anthropologists in this context and in fact something Christina have been saying about the, the issue is that um, as anthropologists we can find ourselves in different uh, positions and I would start from those who in Italy found themselves in the position of being employed in services that um, deal with the migrants, so they out, outsource, which are outsourced through NGO or other associations, and uh, that work in the territory. And so you have anthropology, usually young anthropologists, whose role is not recognized as such, but they end up working in these services at the margins of the policy that has been decided about what has been done. And so they do spend uh, their effort to try and share and to exactly understand what is happening and uh, mediate and help things going better, but in a position which they have very little power, uh, but they can't, it's a, it's a way to find their jobs. There are other anthropologists that can observe and describe these dynamics, at least to take record and produce um, historical traces of what is happening in these years. Uh, in this whole situation that is not so obvious, that is analyzed um, in the right way, in, 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 through a critical way, because um, newspapers and uh, and televisions are very um, pressing on, on certain views that do not really clarify what is happening. So some anthropologists can denounce social dynamics of inequality that appears to be in, in this position. Some others are um, engaging in legal ethnography, studying the ways in which the subject's um, refugee becomes constructed through the process of the asylum seeking request and impact or legal procedures on, on those refugees' lives. So, um, of course, uh, these all possible positions uh, not necessarily um, have a strong impact on what is happening if if um, if uh, some sort of activism can be taken or some sort of um, pressure on policies that are undertaken once to be exerted by by anthropologists as as people who understand certain dynamics and um, I could also report the case a case of uh, students that go in masters on uh, you migrations all over Europe, like, you know, in Denmark, and then they um, find themselves in a context where uh, concepts are criticized, the concepts are, 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 are seen from different points of view, and and they are a little uh, impressed because they actually they would like to work in the context rather than criticize the context. So I, I don't have any, I mean, you know, final solution, but these are some of the things that anthropologists are doing and do. Uh, of course, there are some um, artistic, yeah, uh, it was interesting what Ceiling was saying, because there are also um, artistic um, actions that are, are ways in which uh, the construction of, of the foreign or the migrant changes uh, in the public opinion. So they are quite uh, interesting ways of acting in this field. I mean, this is, these are some of, some of the considerations that I had. And uh, I leave it here, but possible to say other things later. Uh, one trouble is, yeah, we haven't mentioned here is criminalization of solidarity, which is something that is happening all over the places, and then uh, is still there uh, in several, uh, in different moments. One works in this field um, and ready to, I mean, impose. Uh, certain new behaviors that that can be really um directive and i would say fascist all right all right uh francesca thank you very much i think this is going very well in the sense that we have on the one side uh people telling us stories and others like christina and francesca more bringing us to the socio-political administrative and european uh, not only european but um scenario of uh, of the institutions of politics etc so christina once again you have the floor okay thank you uh now uh, i apologize uh, by my poor english because now i'm not going to read i'm going to talk <laughs> uh the best i can 
Uh, I, I maybe I, I start uh, by answering uh, Maxi question. So, what is about those who are success, successful in seeking refugees? That is to that leads to their success. Well, um, according to my research along these years, I can identify identify some uh, conditions for that. So the, the refugees that find their own way uh, um, with dignity and with autonomy here in Portugal are usually um, uh, pe uh, persons, men or women or even families uh, that were already privileged uh, um, uh, uh, in an economic situation. So they already have money, they were professionals, uh, they were sometimes academics even, uh, so they were in an economic comfortable place before the war, before they had to flee. But there are uh, other situations, like this is the majority, this the first ones that I mentioned, but there are uh, uh, other situations, like, uh, for instance, having a family in other European uh, countries that have uh, that are there for many years uh, already as uh, migrants or uh, even citizens, like in Germany, in uh, Netherlands, in Denmark, so they can help. Uh, they they build these networks with their family uh, so that they can help finance financially the refugees that are still waiting for their place here in Portugal. Another condition, very, very important, is to uh, be able to learn, uh, to learn Portuguese. This is very, it's a, a huge issue here in Portugal because uh, all the reports that uh, we as academics do and share with uh, government and NGOs, institutions. Uh, all the um, uh, reports that the uh, refugees associations do and other N NGOs uh, address the fact that the teaching Portuguese lang language is mandatory, uh, but uh, no one can solve the problem till now. When I say no one, I, of course, I'm referring to uh, the ones that are in charge, that have the responsibility to provide this teaching for refugees in, in Portugal. And it's the government that should do that. But till now, no, they just real, uh, rely on a poor tra uh, translation provided by a cell phone, uh, by a phone. Um, and of course, it's not enough. And it's a way, uh, according to, to my research, it's a way to undermine refugees. It's a way to um, not allow them to be properly independent and, uh, um, and to be aware of what's going on in politics and their own rights and, and, and everything. So there are lots of small offers of, of Portuguese language, but it's not a structural um, uh, offer, and it should be. So uh, to, to, to uh, answer Maxi, this is my scenario about uh, your question. Other things that I would like to address is, uh, is this. Of course, uh, being one of the oldest uh, uh, anthropologists uh, that uh, uh, choose to research about refugees here in Portugal. I've been uh, through uh, s different several uh, processes, right? Uh, from uh, furious uh, activists, uh, from uh, um, uh, an academic writing papers, uh, like I said before. Um, now I can tell you in, in th this stage, uh, stage where I, where I am now, that I'm very tired of being an activist. <laughs> this is not at all 
uh, saying that I do not address the importance of uh, 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 having a position positionality because I do, and I affirm it in any situation scenarios in any, in any context, and for me it's very clear where I stand, and like it is a, a very uh, small country, everybody knows each other in this field. Governor, uh, the government institutions, the NGOs, the civil society, the other academics, everyone knows each other. But I, uh, I, um, when I say that I am tired is that uh, in, the, in this process, I realize that it's not affirming my positionality that I reach uh, my goals uh, regarding uh, political action and solidarity with refugees. So I, I found out that uh, until now, uh, I've been talking about power and the existentialism and dependency, um, but rarely about men and women behind this juridical concept of refugee or asylum seeker, right? Uh, so my goal in the last projects that I'm uh, developing also in partnership with other uh, uh, fellows, uh, academics and with other anthropologists and, uh, and also with refugees, stands in another perspective, doing activism, but through art, through performance. Um, I just uh, want to share you something that is, um, a result. Uh, I don't know if I, uh, if I, ah, it's a result of um, a project that I talked to her about um, the 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 forum uh, refugees forum forum and academia na mesa, right? So, I, are you looking at it? Can you look at it? Yes. Can you see it? Right. So this is, uh, it's amazing. It uh, went out uh, two days ago and it's uh, the result putting in a, a flyer uh, uh, that will going to be released this, uh, <clears throat> this um, weekend about what, uh, uh, what uh, the, the, the refugees and the academy and the artists uh, um, that uh, uh, develop uh, 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 platforms of music with refugees or platforms of, of drawing or art, uh, uh, producing art uh, like this. So they, they take uh, all of these, uh, all of our st statements in uh, Zoom meetings or in uh, um, face-to-face -face meetings with refugees with, where everybody is present to show uh, to the people uh, what uh, um, is the result of these meetings. So empower refugees, inform decisions. So they, they, also, they almost um, made a manifesto uh, based in these uh, meetings so that everyone, everybody can access uh, it. And it has lots of things. It has personal stories, it has uh, political statements, it has uh, um, uh, solutions for lear learning uh, uh, Portuguese or to create a business. Uh, the importance of advocacy work. Uh, the, in the right side, you can see a perspective, a academic perspective towards the integration in, of refugees in Portugal. So uh, it's, a, it's a participatory activism 
but based also in reflection, in academic reflection, uh, towards this new um, collaborative uh, uh, way of doing, uh, uh, of finding a way out of this uh, uh, theme uh, regarding the dignity of refugees. So just to sum up, um, what we, and I say we, with all of these uh, people represented here in this flyer, are trying to do is to highlight the uh, knowledge of each one of these refugees, men and women, in so many different ways, like musicians, artists, academics also, businessmen and women. And uh, with that, just uh, share to the government and other uh, state institutions, hey, uh, look what we can gain as a society when we, uh, um, when we uh, recognize that these people are us in other conditions. Like, look what we gain as a society when we uh, uh, give space and, and the floor to their huge knowledge based in an experience that luckily no one of, uh, in this, uh, uh, in this um, webinar uh, have had before because we were not refugees, but our ancestors were. So maybe I uh, passed already the, the time, but uh, it was more or less this that I had to share with you. Thank you. Let's okay. see if I can, uh, if I can okay. what, if I can. Okay, Christina, thank you so much. Can you, yes, undo that, please. We already have some more questions, but let's just first hear the last, uh, our last uh, speaker, well, in the second round, Bella Feldman-Bianco, and then we'll go to the specific questions. Bella? It Sorry, did I undo the... You did, you did. Uh, okay, thank you. I am trying to get back. No, uh, wait, uh, Christina, you undid the... You undid... You didn't undo it because we uh, don't see the images, but we see a text. So you have to undo that. Oh, I'm sorry. We see a paper. I know, I know, but... Oh, please continue. I, I'm, I'm struggling here. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Bella, go ahead, go ahead. All right, it's okay, Christina, you've done it. Ah, okay. okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Carla? Yeah, I want to go back to things that people said, like uh, most of us do field work. In field work, we really get to be, to get to be friends. And, you know, I have uh, friends that call me sisters, and I you know, aunt, you know, from field work. But I think that also, Many people start, talk about, you know, participants' observation. And I like very much the idea of, uh, I forgot the name of this author, Barbara, uh, but that she has this beautiful paper that I give to every student to read. I'm still very active, Clara, although I am retired. <laughs> um, that is from participant observation to the observation of participation. So, in fact, we, uh, I like the postmodernist anthropology I, idea that we are, uh, it's, a really, it's a mutual relation, you know, we, it's, it's a collaboration between ourselves and the, uh, our friends or the subject of our research. So, and this leads to engagement. You know, people ask you for things, you, you know, like right now, for instance, I am uh, uh, I, I am uh, ministering our oral history workshop for a very interesting mo social movement of women of different nationalities, migrants uh, in Sao Paulo. So like you do things like that. But also this leads to uh, engagement in larger scenarios. Uh, uh, when I was doing my field work in 
um, among Portuguese migrants in a small town in, in the United States. I did a video, a, a visual ethnography because of the discrimination, xenophobia, you know, is a piece of research, but it's also something that is shown, it's called Saudade. And I was working with meaning of past and times and spaces in the, in the reconstruction of migrants' identity, something like this. As now, I am mean, like, so fieldwork leads to relationships, leads to engagement. You cannot, you, you do, you, you are working with people and even, and also leads to the subjects, the changing sub, subjects of your research. If I started to work with this, the idea of saudade, nostalgia, uh, I am now like, then I started to work with, with like migration as crime. I advise many times this, this is a migration as crime, as crime, you know, changes, the this, this subject changes. And also this takes me, and also works by, uh, by students and my own work and uh, my roles uh, uh, in, 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 at the Association of Brazilian Anthropology led me to talk, to think about this broader uh, uh, concept of migration and displacements because I saw different patterns, like the same patterns that I was watching in my research on migrants happening like in the urban peripheries of Brazil or with Indians that are indigenous people. That is really that ongoing criminalization of poverty. And you know, all, not all migrants are poor, are, are poor you know, and, and so, but in any case, those that are detained in the, at the borders, you know, and you have people from different social classes that are in this situation. And, and this leads also to a social action together with our friends in, 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 field, in field work. And Cristina uh, Santino's uh, 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 talk and pictures show what's possible, possible to do, this engagement. And I think that we are always engaged. You know, we are called to be engaged. Like I am known here in Sao Paulo in the field as the professora militante, the activist professor, you know, they call me professor, it's, it's good, you know, but this is how I'm, I'm called. And, and in terms also of the, the committee of migration and displacement at the ABBA, we are doing now a series of webinars about like just now, Monday, we are going to have a webinar uh, on uh, the, the issues of land, uh, the, the, the indigenous people, and particularly the Munduruku Indians, together with them, about the fact that they are losing their land because of mining. Uh, and this is like, and they are very much engaged in this issue. So we are going to have a talk with anthropologists and, and the indigenous people. And we have indigenous people that turn into anthropologists, what is very interesting. And they are very active. And so another webinar, I'm going to give you examples to see like how these issues, uh, criminal, the criminalization issues are, are broader, like we have colleagues that are studying migrants in prison and sometimes not only migrants. And now we are going to have another seminar about with survivors of a prison that was, now is not a prison anymore, but when uh, most of the detained people were murdered by police. So we are going to have um, uh, about this. And we are going to have another, uh, uh, webinar that's also social uh, social action and anthropology academic anthropology that's about the border of the United States and Mexico with with uh, 
uh, anthropologist and sociologist from Mexico and also from Brazil about what is happening, the brutality that is happening in this border with the uh, Asians and the car caravans of the people from Central America and Brazilians that are detained. So this is also social action. And now I think that in terms of, you know, like Christina's uh, work, yeah, I think that the way that migrants and refugees themselves organize themselves is also in terms of art. Musicians, uh, the hip hop, for instance, the content of the hip hop, um, uh, uh, painters, like, uh, I, I am following this all the time, you know, it, it's very interesting. So like, I think that engagement is part of our work and it's very important to stand up. Uh, I, and sometimes it's very difficult, but I think that is, is constitutive of being an anthropologist. And I think that this, uh, uh, the other thing that I, the, 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 what we are studying are, is led here the, from our own research and the research uh, uh, changes according to the situation. So, uh, this All right. is uh, enough. All uh, right, thank uh, you. Uh, uh, Bella. Okay. Um, you, you, you finished? Okay, because I just wanted, because we've been here already one and a half hour and we do have some very interesting questions on the site, on the chat, sorry. Yeah, on the site, on the, but uh, some of them you've addressed already, like Christina has already addressed some of the questions concerning uh, who are the successful refugees. That was one of the questions that Muggsy brought about, but there's other questions. Uh, one of them, of course, is the, matter of uh, the question of language that Cristina addressed um, on how, you know, what happens in Portugal that refugees have to learn Portuguese, what happens with other people, what happens with other countries where that does not work or doesn't have to be, a, it's not mandatory. But I think another very interesting uh, comment dash question that um, arose here in the chat is the question of legitimity and real and fake refugees. I, I, I mean, I think that from all the, sub themes we've addressed here, such as the issue of uh, the relationship between anthropology and and refugees and how anthropologists have to be activists as Bella now addressed. And I know very well you are very active, Bella. When I said retired, I, I meant retired from academic duties in the university. We all know that you are tremendously active. And, and exactly this question of activism and anthropology and you know the, the relation uh, between these two uh, things that we do, being academics, but being activists. But I also think that directly relates with this question on the chat and this comment by Muggsy, also by Virginia, also by Gordon. What is what is a fake and a real refugee? How would you, I think this is a very interesting point. What is a fake refugee? What is a real refugee? Who wants to, now we're open on discussion so we don't have to follow the the norm, uh, the rule of uh, from east to west. But Ceiling has something to say, please. Hi, um, thank you. Um, so I think the you, you can say that the those who get recognized as refugees nowadays are those who have bodily wounds and scars, especially to show that you have been physically tortured. This is something that I think Didier Fassan has already discussed uh, in his book uh, on humanitarian reason about how increasingly uh, the recognition rate is getting lower and how the standards is now more and more medicalized rather than relying on the narratives of those who are applying for um, asylum. So who is a fake and who is a real refugee? So if you don't have scars, if you're not um, fleeing your own country because of political persecution or religious persecution, then you're considered fake. But what if the poverty, the economic conditions in your country was a product of the geopolitics that generated, you know, the polarization of wealth or the, the kind of climate uh, uh, development that made this that created conditions of forced displacement and 
where do we trace the root of the problem? Do we have to identify that clear political agent or do we actually locate their sufferings or the, what propelled them to leave home into history, into geopolitics? So that's something that we have to think about. Furthermore, I think the idea of a refugee is a product of the nation state system. And so, and then of course is the inequalities between the nation states. So you can see that some countries, people get more recognized as refugees, partly because of the particular relationship between certain countries. And, and so if you're Somali, so the US may take more of the Somalis because of particular reasons. So I, I think that we need to be more critical rather than just think it's all gonna be chaos, assuming that we don't have chaos right now. And, and so, so let me stop there. Thank you so much, uh, Ceiling. Does anyone else want to pitch in with this uh, yeah, question, like comment on real and fake? Francesca? I have not raised my hand, but of course, uh, the question is real. We're real uh, and fake is, um, the, the, the entire thing is about mobility. I mean, uh, one day, uh, I mean, mobility was there uh, before nation states were there, and, and, and now uh, it's more and more strict the possibility of, of, of being mobile anyway. And so, fake and, and real it does, wouldn't really make sense because then there are so many narratives that must be put forward in order to be able to move, not because you are or you are not a refugee, but because you can't move otherwise. So, this is something that you also creates a lot of uh, problems that uh, the entire discourse that is around these issues um, is, um, is pushed towards uh, presenting one's own position in the most horrible and possible way and because otherwise it's not possible to move on. There are countries where this is easier for certain people. I mean, um, but countries where this is has become very, very difficult, like all the Mediterranean countries, uh, the ones that are actually on the Mediterranean Sea and, uh, and uh, or um, Mexico with the United States. So, I mean, the question of being fake or not fake, of course, uh, nowadays, the discourse uh, makes it that if you really want to be able to move, you should possibly try to be recognized as refugees, otherwise, you won't have any chance, which was not the case 20 years ago. Can I say something also? Uh, like, I think that we have to look at the geo geopolitics also. Uh, like in Brazil, for instance, uh, we have uh, when, uh, people from Venezuela. They act now they can get refugee visas, but if, if, and not the, uh, we had a humanist visa that was giving, that is giving by to Asians and also people that come from Syria. But also the fact that people ask for a refugee visa is also a strategy in order to get some documents, uh, some documents, they sometimes they know that they won't get, they won't get it, but it's a, a strategy to remain in the country. Uh, and I, what happened is that people, I don't know if they, I would use fake and not fake, like Francesca said, people really want, they, they move and they want to have some, Visas, documents are very important, uh, but um, in fact, the number of refugee visas that are given is very small, it's still very small, and it's a matter of people that can prove that they were persecuted. Uh, it's still just based on you know wars and persecution, and then they have to some. In some way, yeah, this is like 
how they perform to get the, the, the refugee visa or not. I don't know. Yeah, this is what I want to see. Okay, thank you so much, Bella and Francesca and Celine. Does anyone else want to pitch in? Christina? Yes, just uh, a little um, moment to, to say that uh, for me, it's it, uh, fake refugees uh, is a thing that doesn't exist, okay? It's uh, the government, uh, the right-wing government the, uh, that uh, uh, addressed that concept. Um, of course, uh, in, in the middle of this, of all these people that uh, fighting to save their lives in the borders on in the Mediterranean, Mediterranean Sea, uh, we can see um, migrants, okay, migrants that ask for uh, 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 to enter in in a, uh, in a country like Italy, Greece, Spain, and even Portugal, um, their previous uh, stories could be exactly the same as uh, uh, what we call, as we know, as refugee stories. So this this cause the juridical concept of refugee is something that is imposed by the states in Europe or in Africa or in the Asia or wherever. It's a, a, a it's a, 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 of course, we know the importance of uh, 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 the, um, that's uh, behind the juridic concept of refugees. Uh, and we know as, uh, as uh, researchers that there are uh, uh, rights um, access to rights dif differently if they are uh, uh, considered refugees or immigrants, but life, the real life of them that shared all this struggle to arrive to a safe place, it's the same. So it's not, it's not uh, uh, um, our uh, um, position uh, to uh, to to divide them, I don't know if I'm if I can explain well uh, uh, what I'm saying. Uh, for instance, uh, in this course that I created, this project of uh, living in a different culture uh, that permit the access of refugees to to university. Um, the first word year it was just uh, uh, um, uh, refugees. Okay. Uh, from Africa, from uh, Asia, from lots of places. The second course, the second year, uh, I decided to, to do it, to, to accept refugees and migrants. I don't care about their, uh, uh, about their juridical statute. I just care about their lives and they're willing to uh, taking a course and be, being able to uh, to enroll in the academic courses that may uh, made the complete difference in their path to um, getting away from this uh, um, very uh, framed concept, juridical concept, okay, and uh, getting uh, getting away to become citizens, Portuguese citizens. That's all. I don't know if I explain myself. <laughs> if you yes, yes, you yes. did, you did, you did. I think it. I think you have a point there, Christina. It's where is the the line between refugee and migrants that are also it, it's a juridical and political yeah. line, not not necessarily uh, a life path, it's not necessarily uh, different uh, uh, situations uh, in. Uh, in this, because there are migrants that also were tortured and killed and political per, uh, pursuit in their own countries. But when they arrive, they, when they uh, uh, finally uh, can break all these, these uh, walls and arrive to a, a European country, for instance, they can be considered 
not as a refugee, but as a migrant. So much less, uh, um, uh, uh, much less uh, 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 protection. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So we work with people, not necessarily with the juridical concepts. That's my point of view as an anthropologist. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, I don't know. Well, in this kind of third round, which is not really a third round, it's mixed, and uh, we have uh, brought in the input from the questions in the chat. Does anyone else want to say anything else? Joy, do you want to add anything to the discussion, or are you there? Yes. Just really to say that I agree with what Christina is saying. I mean, I think we understand that concepts are important. It it kind of gives us entry into into the literature which extends beyond um, anthropology. I mean, we've, we've had anthropologists working on migration, 1950s, 1960s, 1970s. You know, my, my uh, PhD supervisor worked on what he referred to as Britallians. Um, so if, if we understand that there is a conceptual terrain that we need to access in order to understand our research area, we also understand as anthropologists that um, the value of that concept uh, is limited, especially when you're working with people and especially if you work the way we do, which is from the bottom up. Yeah. Um, and if we understand that, then we will also recognize the histories of each continent and each country and how, for example, in, you know, in Africa, uh, with a scramble for Africa, sovereignty was imposed from external actors, European actors, colonial states. Um, and so we need to we need to really start questioning the, the value of of those concepts across our our terrain uh -huh. and our uh -huh. territories. Yes, and I I think you're totally right. And actually, I think what you just said addresses a bit the topic, uh, the, the question that or the comment that Virginia just made on the chat is the topic just for applied or engaged anthropologists, in the sense that you know we we are talking here. We have participants that are very engaged in activism, as Christina and Bella, and uh, probably all others from what from the materials you've shown of uh, from videos to drawings, etc., and stories. You are all engaged, and I I understand what Virginia is asking, but uh, probably it's very hard. It's a topic where it's very very hard to be engaged in and not become activist. I don't know. I, I'm I don't work on refugees, but the people who do, Christina is raising her hand. It's probably probably very, very difficult, no? So, Christina? Yeah, yeah I think it's very difficult. Uh, like I uh, said in the first round, we have to take sides. Because if there are refugees, and I'm just talking about refugees now, let's not mix all this. Uh, if there is uh, political bad options, uh, politic, uh, politics that uh, disregard uh, human rights. So yes, we, we, when we start this uh, research uh, theme, we know it's a political thing that we have to address, that we have to take sides, and that is our field work, okay? That make us uh, engaged, not the opposite. In, uh, independent of what are my ideological or political perspectives as a citizen, okay? But like I said also before, um, we, we also, we have to, to balance uh, between uh, being only in the field doing protests uh, uh, side by side with refugees, or uh, uh, if we are also engaged in, in our academic job that is also writing papers, okay? So it, we have to do this balance between one and the other. Uh, so it's not only being activist, but recognizing that we write on the papers that we share with our, with our fellows anthropologists in academia, is this weight uh, behind us? And then we try to be objective, scientific, uh, 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 but, uh, uh, and it's not mandatory that we are always uh, applied anthropologists, but in somehow we know inside of us and we express it like 
in this webinar that we have a, 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 a political position regards yes. this topic. Okay, thank you so much. Well, we've been here almost two hours, guys. Uh, it's 10 to, to, to four here in Lisbon. So that means one hour, two, one hour, 50 minutes we've been in this webinar. So look, this is, I think, a, a, an endless topic because it's so interesting and, and especially it's so up-to-date in the world we live in nowadays. But I just wanted to leave a, a sort of a final note here because Gordon and, and Muggsy were writing and, um, and they were sort of, questioning something that very idealistic that Joy uh, said about, you know, uh, transposing barriers and borders, but the fact that is that, yes, these barriers and these borders are here. And, um, and so that's definitely <laughs> one, of the, one of the topics we've been discussing is how, how can we as anthropologists, of course we cannot as anthropologists, um, do away with the, with the borders. There's no way we can do it, but we can at least, um, also, I think, as activists and, and, and making a difference in, in society in general, um, try to overcome the, the problems and the constraints that those borders impose. Um, so I don't know if anything, if anyone has anything final to say. I think there's very good questions in the chat. Normally, this is, uh, as you know, taped. It's been recorded and it will be available on the site on the well site. Um, I have sent the participants the link to the previous webinars and to this one as well. And uh, normally we also, Ricardo and Michelle also managed to record, um, to keep a record of the chat. So uh, there are some suggestions and links there. And, um, and uh, while well, we can finish with Mugsy's suggestion for a future webinar is the question of 19C. Well, I, I suppose you mean COVID created uh, nation states and border that go with them. So that's a suggestion. Although it, we did in the last year, uh, touch a lot of the, oh, no, it's not COVID, it's the 19th century, so, sorry, created nation states and borders that go with them, of course. Yes, of course. Uh, yes, it's, uh, it, would, it would be, that would be definitely a continuation of this webinar because as Bella also developed um, all the issues of creating borders already in the 19th century bring uh, arose also what the scenario that we have nowadays. Hmm. Well, um, well, I want to thank once again everyone for participating. I think it has been a very, very interesting webinar. As I said, a super interesting topic. We could be here for hours and hours, but uh, we all have other duties. And um, so once again, everyone, and um, well, uh, keep checking the WOW and the WCEA site. We will have our next webinar in approximately seven weeks. So in, in two months' time, towards the end of November. And um, we will welcome everyone uh, to, to be with us. And as you know, nowadays, the, presently, that the webinars are being uh, shared not only here on Zoom, but also on Facebook and live uh, streaming. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for also to all the others that were on the chat and uh, uh, made their input with their questions and comments. Thank you and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.